I introduce our guest, I wanted to talk about this initiative that we're launching here at the Honolulu Psychology Collective. We are starting to just do some community education where we bring the knowledge, the skill, and the wisdom to this collective group of people to the community so that um, people can just have access to some of the things that we've learned um, that we're passionate about, we wanted to share. These um, talks will show up on the journal that is here um, on our website here at the Honolulu Psychology Collective website. You will be able to access this recording. Please feel free to share it with friends and family at a later date. So it's part of our initiative to be present in the community. Okay, and we call it the ivory tower to kitchen table because so much of what happens at the university stays at the university. And that just didn't make sense to us. We wanted to demystify psychology and bring it to our community. So here's our collective folks. If you have a chance to go to the website, please see some of these wonderful faces. There's a lot of talent here collectively. We're so grateful and proud to have all of these folks here with us um, working at the collective and for the community. So today we're gonna focus on this young human here, Zena, and um, allow me to introduce her. Zena might have come to us about you know, just short of a year ago, I think, um, and I'll let her correct me later um, if I've gotten that wrong, but um, what we consider early career psychologist, which means that all of the knowledge is fresh to her. Um, it's new, um, you know, like I went through my classes 20 years ago, it's older knowledge. She's got fresh stuff and she's bringing it to us with a lot of her own wisdom and grace. Um, she did her doctorate and her master's degree in clinical psychology at Hawaii School for Professional Psychology, which I think at some point may have morphed into Argosy, which may have morphed into Chaminade. Um, you know that some of our education here in Hawaii, um, we struggle to um, offer the doctorate programs here in Hawaii so that people don't have to go to the continent to study. So um, that's, she has traveled some of those roads. So she's here now practicing and specializing um, in autism, ADHD, and other learning disorders. I know that Dr. Ewing does some neural testing and assessment. Um, she says she is from Chicagoland, uh, which I find to be fun. Um, bounced around the Midwest, somehow ended up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here at HPC with this charming little pet that might show up today called Zephyr. Zephyr is a cockatiel and seems to um, bring so much light to all of Zena's um, sessions. So let me see, without further ado, what I think I'm gonna do is kind of hand it over to you. You ready, Zena? I think we are. Well, so Zephyr has Zephyr. decided she needs to come say hi. Um, I had changed shirts because she was just eating all of my buttons, and apparently this one is also one we need to chew on. So, <laughs> but you're right. It has been almost a year since I connected with you, Alana. Um, I think sometime in May was when we first um, got to know each other. Yeah, so it's been lovely working in the collective. The moment I'm just doing therapy, all 100% telehealth, and it has been great fun working with people both on Oahu and on outer islands. So... You very kindly offered to let me launch our things. Without further ado, let's get into it. And I apologize for this is not smooth. This is my first time using Zoom to present. So I think we're good. All right, so today we're gonna talk about asexuality and it is nothing new. But first, uh-oh, see, there we go. Let's talk about why this talk and why now. So International Asexuality Day is on April 6th. It started in 2021. Uh, it was started by internationallysexualityday.org. They're a nonprofit organization with an international committee that got together and talked about what day is like the least conflicting with other events and things both around the world and across cultures. So there's some debate on whether or not April 6th will be International Sexuality Day next year as well, only because that's going to fall in Autism Awareness Week. So they're waiting to hear back from autism community and sort of the events and things, decide if it's still going to be April 6th, but for now it is still that. So if you want to, you can always check out the website and see what they have to say about that. So why this talk? 
Asexuality is part of the LGBTQ plus community, and it doesn't really get talked about enough. And there are some problems with that. And so it's just part of raising awareness. And just in my own way of celebrating International Ace Day, I wanted to give this talk. So thank you all for attending and hope you learned something about asexuality today. So let's start with some definitions. So for sexual orientation refers to attraction, not action. So it is your preference for something, not necessarily your behavior. So like, I don't like sponge cake. My preference is to not eat sponge cake, but there are times where I'm going to eat the cake anyway. So maybe like one of my younger cousins has made a cake and they're really proud of it. I'm going to eat the cake. Maybe you've made pineapple upside down cake. I'm going to eat that because I like pineapples and it's delicious. But none of that changes the fact that my, my preference is to not eat sponge cake. So again, sexual orientation is about attraction and preference, not about action or behavior. And so while we're at it, attraction has different levels or different types. So for this talk, we're just gonna look at these three types. So aesthetic attraction is interest in the beauty of someone. So just like going to an art museum and you find a really stunning statue, you might decide like, that's really cool to look at. I like this statue, my preference is to keep looking at it. So that's necessarily that like, I want to make out the statue or engage any kind of romantic or sexual inter like interactions with it. I just like the beauty of it. My preference is to look at that. So what that might look like in people is maybe you really like green eyes. You just find green eyes compelling. Or maybe you like people with lots of freckles. That's just your aesthetic preferences. So obviously then there's romantic attractions, romantic interest in someone. So you might decide that this person is someone that I'm attracted to romantically. I want to date them. It doesn't automatically mean that there is a sexual attraction. A lot of times in society, we assume that we're romantically attracted. We're also sexually attracted. And that's not always the case. So for this talk, we're definitely going to keep those separate because that's kind of a huge part of asexual identity is not having a sexual interest. But we'll get there in a moment. So I also wanted to mention gender identity, which is the perception of one's own gender. Oftentimes, there's just this idea that asexuality is about gender somehow or means that someone hates their gender or other genders and that's not it. Asexuality is about sexual preferences. It's not about your gender identity. So I also want to throw in the queer community in there. It's a term I might use a few times throughout this talk and that just refers to anyone in the LGBTQIA plus community. So anyone who is part of the queer community and we refer to them as queer community. That also includes asexuality. So ace is a shorter term for an asexual person. Oftentimes, um, the asexual community has lots of jokes about being an ace. So one of my favorites is, I have an ace up my sleeve. It's me. I'm the ace. An allosexual or non-asexual person is anyone who's kind of the opposite of asexual. So these are people who do experience sexual attraction of some kind. So typically, we'd think of that as like your heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever terms we have that's not asexual. So it's not that like being bi is the opposite of ace. It's that having consistent asexual attraction to people is opposite of ace. So an A-spec or A-spec is the asexuality spectrum. I tend not to use those ones very often just because I get tongue twied under them, but I thought it'd be helpful to know those as well. So let's jump into it. What is asexuality? So unfortunately, this might be hard to grasp because it's defined by an absence of something. So it's the lack of experiencing sexual attraction in others. So Sometimes ace people will make memes about my asexual preferences. Nope, because they're just not attracted to other people in that way. So they might have aesthetic attraction towards others. That might be romantic attraction, but the sexual preferences tend to not be directed at any particular gender, sex, or other person necessarily. So any sexual person is not drawn sexually to others, but may still want to have romantic or platonic relationships. Doesn't mean they can't fall in love. Doesn't mean they can't like want to be married, etc. So an asexual person does not usually desire to act upon attraction to others in a sexual way, right? So you might still engage in sexual acts, and that might be because it's fun, because it's joy enjoyable, but not necessarily because I am sexually attracted to this specific human being. So asexuality is not a biological dysfunction. So like it's not that body parts aren't working or we're missing organs. Everything is still there and works fine. It's just they're just not attracted to other people. So they may still engage in like masturbation or sexual acts with people. But it's not necessarily because my preference is for something. So again, like I might eat cake because it's important to someone or that cake looks like fun, but doesn't mean my overall preference to not have cake has changed. So in that vein, then, um, asexual people refer to themselves as sex positive versus sex repulsed. So a sex repulsed person is kind of more of the stereotypical idea of what an asexual person is. This is someone who's not interested in sexual acts with another person at all. So it might be that we find sex disgusting. Maybe it's boring just not interested, 
where a sex positive asexual person is willing to engage in sex acts. And just like any other person who engages in sexual behavior, anyone who's allosexual, this may be with a specific person or multiple partners. Simply having sex with someone does not mean you can't be asexual or this person is not asexual. And just because they want to have sex with lots of people doesn't mean that they're lying about their sexuality. Their sexual preference towards people has not changed just because they're engaging in sex. So remember, sexual orientation is about attraction, not action. So in the same similar vein, sometimes people mix up asexuality with celibacy or abstinence. So asexuality is about a preference, right? Whereas celibacy and abstinence are about actions. So I choose to be celibate for X, Y, Z reasons. It can be for social, religious, circumstance, or personal reasons. So like someone might choose not to eat cake because they want to be healthier, or they might not choose to eat cake because they have diabetes, or they had food poisoning once, now they don't want to have cake anymore. You know, like there's lots of reasons why someone might choose to ha have sex, but that's about an action I'm taking. I'm choosing not to have this, or it might even just be it wasn't available to me, so I haven't had cake in a long time because it wasn't around. So an asexual person might be celibate or abstinent, or they might not. And it doesn't mean that their sexual orientation is a lie or is wrong, whatever, just because they aren't celibate, they aren't abstinent. And the vice versa also applies. Just because someone tells you that they are celibate or abstinent does not mean that they're automatically asexual. So those things are different. So a lot of the times, the asexual community will make jokes about preferring garlic bread to sex or cake to sex. And so I thought it'd be fun to include both of those on here because I'm not a cake person. All right, so we've kind of hinted at there are some gray areas with asexuality, right? So some people do actually have sexual um, attraction to others, but this might happen very rarely or be very fleeting. So it might be just long enough to notice like, oh, I was sexually attracted for two seconds there. Or it might be that like once in a blue moon, I find I'm attracted to someone and that attraction may or may not fall into sort of like the other categories we have in the queer community about sex. And that's why it's hard to decide, you know, like, okay, then am I asexual or am I actually one of these allosexual commu um, me community members? So the big overarching term for those people is gray asexual. So that may be graces or gray aces, and it's anyone who falls between asexual and allosexual. Uh, one of the big groups inside of that is also called demisexuals, and these are people who require close connection before attraction may happen. So this might be either we've had a long friendship and have just gotten really close, and so now I might have had sexual attraction to you. It might be that we had a really good team bonding thing at work, and now I find that I might have sexual attraction. But just because there is that close bond there does not mean that they're automatically going to have attraction. So they're not automatically attracted to all of their friends just because they're good friends and they feel close to each other. It's just that they require having that closeness before sexual attraction may happen. And sometimes this means that they look more like heterosexual or homosexual or what have you from the outside because the people they tend to pursue romantically and sexually are in line in those ways. But they may know, like, I needed to have that closeness first. And so it doesn't quite then fit into that nice, neat category of hetero or homosexual or what have you. So these NAs fall under the asexual umbrella, the, the aspec, the asexual spectrum of identities, and there are so, so very many in there that it's not easy to qualify or quantify how many there are. Um, I encourage you guys to go look out about some of those things. It is pretty interesting some of the different nuances there are in that gray area of being purely asexual and being purely allosexual. So this is the asexual pride flag. Um, the black is for asexual community, gray is for everyone that we just talked about, gray ace or demis, or anyone else who falls under that umbrella. And the white is for non-asexuals, allosexuals, and allies, and purple is for community. So this flag was created in 2010 after a month-long sort of like community-driven effort to decide what would be the best flag. And supposedly, purple is chosen by the creator of the Asexuality, Visibility, and Education Network due to this legend that putting purple amethyst in a cup of wine could stop you from getting drunk. So it's kind of like a loose metaphor for asexuality that I thought was kind of interesting. That's part of why my theme for all of this is purple, because I thought that was fun. But 2010 is kind of when more awareness about asexuality as an orientation took off. So, however, asexuality is uncommon. It's not new. So estimates place prevalence at approximately 1% of the population. This is a conservative estimate. Not everyone knows that they can identify as asexual. Not everyone knows the nuances behind that. So this is like a really rough guess. It could be higher, and we just don't know right now.
And asexuality has been around for basically as long as there have been people. So just because we haven't had the term asexual for like throughout history doesn't mean those people have not existed. So like sometimes people might refer to someone who was born a eunuch and they've always been a eunuch their whole life. And, and through a modern lens, that sounds kind of like asexuality. But just as far as Western history goes, in the 1860s, we started seeing terms more like heterosexual, homosexual, and monosexual coined. Monosexual seems to be pretty analogous to what we now consider asexuality. In 1890s, um, some German philosophers use anesthesia sexual and asensuality for sort of the same term as we're getting closer to asexuality. And our first records of the actual term asexual being used is in the 1900s. I believe a pastor was being... Um, arrested for promoting uh basically just like diversity and equity inclusion stuff for queer community and they actually listed asexual as one of the things he was promoting which i thought was interesting so raising awareness you know geico going on so kinsey Re kinsey i don't know if you're familiar with him but he's kind of one of the huge researchers as far as human sexuality goes. In the 1940s, he did a huge survey of Americans, and he included a category X, which is a catch-all term for males that sociosexual contacts or reactions, which means he was doing all these studies with people, and he found that he had this subset of specifically males who were not reacting in the ways heterosexual or homosexual people do to um, stimuli and just had not ever had sex. And took him a while to add that category to women as well, so that didn't happen until the 1950s. And from there, in the 1960s and 70s, term asexual started to become more popularized and began to appear in media. So David Bowie actually has an interview he did with Rolling Stone where he talks about asexuality. The Archie Comics character Jughead is commonly believed to be asexual by the community. Mostly because a lot of the times he's more interested in eating burgers than in having a girlfriend. And there's actually a crossover between Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Army, or the Archie comics, where Sabrina accidentally casts a spell that makes all of the girls in Riverdale fall in love with um, Jughead. And he's really upset by this and spends the whole time running away. And she realizes the only way to reverse the spell is to make all of them disinterested in him. And he's totally fine with that because then he can go back to his life and not have to worry about anyone romantically or sexually pursuing him. Sounds like he's pretty much an ace character. So there is, yeah, we want to go down that top. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, as we got more raising awareness, um, psychology started to become more invested in uh, asexuality. But however, in 1980, it was pathologized by the American Psychiatric Association, which is the group that makes a diagnostic and statistical manual of dis uh, mental disorders, which is sort of like the Bible of diagnosing in the psychology field. So the third edition has um, asexuality pathologized. There's two different order disorders. And I apologize, I don't remember what those are right now. However, in 2013, so 33 years later, APA finally decided asexuality is an orientation and not a disorder. So these are actually pictures of the DSM-5. Um, the relevant parts are highlighted. So if a lifelong lack of sexual desire is better explained by one's self-identification as asexual, then a diagnosis of female sexual interest arousal disorder would not be made. And if the man's desire is explained by self-identification as asexual, then a diagnosis of male hypoactive sexual desire disorder is not made. So you may notice that in the female sexual disorder there, they put asexual in quotes. That's a little bit problematic because it implies that that's not exactly legitimate disorder. So what that means is as clinicians, we need to know to screen for asexuality. Not everyone knows, right? about asexuality, they don't all know that that's an option that they can identify that way. So part of, you know, looking at someone who's saying like, hey, I haven't have this set of symptoms that matches up with this disorder, we need to know to ask like, hey, do you think maybe this identity fits for you and explore that before giving them that label? Because a lot of the symptoms there do overlap with the experience of asexuality. However, societal pressure to be sexual is really more of what drives the distress in someone who is ace versus someone who just has um, less into libido, which might be solvable through medication or has some kind of response or some mental blockage going on. So again, for an ace person, they may look like they have some of these sexual disorders because of societal pressure to be sexual, which is causing the distress, rather than actual their lived experience of being a sexual person. So we need to be aware that that difference is there and help people tease out like, okay, is it this or is it that? Also, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm really bothered that only in 
the female sexual disorder, do they bother to put asexuality in square quotes? I don't understand what that necessarily means, but that feels like we got some more work to do as just a field. So the other problem is that both of those exclusions referring to a person self-identifying as asexual is not included in the desk reference version of the DSM. So what that means is the smaller version that you can flip through easily and just check off disorders, make sure like, okay, a criteria to be like, yes, this person meets the disorder description doesn't warn people that you need to rule out asexuality. So if someone doesn't think to themselves, hey, maybe I'll just flip through the rest of this desk reference to this random other page and like, oh, maybe I should ask them about asexuality. They're not going to see that. So sometimes we might miss people are having a different experience than what the disorder in the book says, and that can cause distress. And in fact, some people have learned that they are asexual only because they sought treatment for some of these sexual disorders and it didn't work, it didn't help, it didn't fix them because there's nothing there to be fixed. They just needed help with understanding some of like the microaggressions and pressure of society and how to deal with those instead. So in kind of that vein, there are some special mental health challenges, the ACE community. So the Trevor Project, which is a nonprofit organization in the United States, started in 1998, I believe, um, to help address the suicide um, epidemic in queer youth, which for them is anyone ages 13 to 24. So that's queer and questioning youth. Apologize. So they did a survey in 2020, and they found that ACE youth reported higher rates of anxiety and depression than other queer kids. So already like at a minimum, we know that that community of youth tends to have higher anxiety and depression anyway, just because of the stigma and bias they're facing in the world and worries about whether or not their family will accept them for coming out. For ACE youth have that even higher. And they're also more likely to be transgender or non-binary. So they looked at the proportion of youth who are identifying as ACE in their study. They found that a higher proportion of them are more likely to be transgender or non-binary than the general population. So that means they may also have higher rates of gender dysphoria, but we don't know because we haven't really done a whole lot of research on the ACE community. And again, this is just looking at ACE youth, so we don't even know what that might look like in adults or kids who are even younger than this group. So there are similar struggles to other orientations in the ACE community, like there's social isolation, alienation, microaggressions, and the stigma, negative bias in society. There is actually some aphobia. People will make hurtful comments because they are either just don't understand asexuality or have some kind of fear about it. Some people really feel that someone telling you like, hey, I'm not sexually interested in you or anyone really is like a personal judgment. And some people then will engage in what would be hate crimes except that in the United States, there's only one law that includes asexuality in sexual orientation discrimination. That is a 2002 law in New York. So we definitely have some work to do. And unfortunately, the way we have worded some of our laws preventing sexual orientation discrimination, it is debatable on whether or not asexuality would be covered under that. So some people believe that we don't need to change that because ace people can pass as straight, et cetera. However, there are still people who have issues around people identifying as asexual, and so we need to protect the community from those people. So we definitely have some work to do. So let's talk about some myths about asexuality. Huge one is that, like asexuality isn't real, right? Or it's not the same. It's the same as celibacy or abstinence. It's a lie. You're making it up for attention. You just haven't had sex with the right person. None of these things are true, right? So we've talked about how People can still want to engage in sex, like it can still be fun to masturbate, have an orgasm. And having done those things doesn't mean a person isn't actually asexual. They're not confused. They're not making it up. They don't just want your attention. That is just their lived experience. So it's the same as just me, like, me telling you I don't like cake. It doesn't mean I'm lying if I have cake. It doesn't mean I'm making it up if I have some cake but not other cake. I don't like cake. Right. In the same way, an asexual person doesn't have a preference for other people, typically. Right. We talk about the gray aces and how that happens sporadically. That doesn't mean they're lying if they decide to engage in sexual behavior. And so it's not a hormone problem. It's not like a genetic disorder. It's not a biological issue. It's not caused by a brain tumor. And yes, men can also be asexual. They're not like these super hyper sexualized people as well. Like some of them are, sure, but also. We still don't know, but it seems like there's an equal um, prevalence of ace people who are male and female um, from scientific birth to sex. So someone tells you that they are ace. What now? 
So listen and try to understand, do some of your own research, check your biases, right? So if you have a kind of strong reaction, check in yourself and find out what that's about. Maybe you might be able to talk that out with the person, maybe not. I would typically encourage you to not do that in the first conversation they're telling you, especially if they're your child or a younger person and you're like a position of authority over them. Don't do that your first talk. Maybe don't do whatever with them. Depends. You have to check in and decide what makes the most sense. So the thing to do is make sure you accept this is part of their identity. This is going to be pretty solid. Yes, there's some fluctuation over time. They might find out that like, hey, I thought it was ace. Actually, I'm demi. They're still falling under the asexual umbrella. This has not changed. They're not going to magically become something else now. So please don't forget that they've told you, right? Like this is part of they are now. So another thing you can do is ask if there's anything you can do to support them. Maybe they might want you to engage in some asexual awareness week stuff, which is the last week of October of every year. Maybe they don't want you to do anything. They just wanted you to know this information. Always ask them first, right? And so in the similar vein, make sure you don't tell anyone without their permission first. And even if they give you permission, make sure that you check in with them that like, hey, this is still a thing that you're okay with me doing or want me to do before you do the thing. Because sometimes you get like, you say, yeah, it sounds great. And then you pause and you're like, oh no, that sounds awful. It's always good to check in to make sure first before you tell people. So also don't get angry and blame them. This is not something that's really in their control. Just like you can't control the fact that you are the height you are or that you were born to the family you are. An asexual person cannot control the fact that they are asexual. It is just part of who they are. And it's not about you. So try not to take that personally. There's nothing there that needs to be fixed. There's no nothing to argue about. They don't need to be reassured they're going to change or it'll change in the different in the, in the future or be different in the future. It's okay for them to be who they are right now. Don't miss what they've told you and don't forget about what they've told you or forget, right? So not to say, don't ask them, what about kids or grandkids? There are so many ways to have children without necessarily them being biologically yours. And even then, maybe surrogacy is an option, right? And the point of someone telling you I'm ace is not for you to then ask them like, well, but how are you going to carry on your genes? Or how are you going to give me grandkids? There's something there that is driving them telling you and you need to respect that. It's like, yes, it makes sense in, maybe in your context to later talk about like, hey, have you thought about these things? Like, I'm concerned about you or like, this is a dream that I had and I'm kind of sad and I want to talk to you about it. That can be fair depending on your specific context. But the first time someone tells you they are ace, do not ask them immediately, what about kids or what about grandkids? And equally so, don't be like, hey, you dated someone or you've had sex, so you're not asexual. Remember, asexual people can have sexual experiences, and they might be demi, they might be gray ace, and so that still is in line with them telling you that they are ace. And, sorry, I have a hard time with this one. So telling someone you're too young to know for sure is not helpful. Even if you truly believe that they are too young to know for sure, this is their truth right now in this moment. And yes, kids still have to figure some things out, but there's a lot of research that suggests that even from like kindergarten up, kids might start realizing like, hey, I have a preference towards people who look this way. I have a preference towards people who act this way. I like guys. I like girls. Yes, it may not be the understanding that like I want to have sex with them one day when I'm older and that's appropriate, but it doesn't mean they can't know just because they're little. And even if they change their mind later, it doesn't mean they were lying. It doesn't really mean they changed their mind either. It means that they gained a better understanding of themselves and they realized that like, actually, this label is no longer helpful for me. But right now, this is the label that is, and please honor that with them. Also, don't mention like everyone feels like that sometimes. Like, yes, not everyone goes around every day being like, yeah, I want to have some sex. It's going to be great. Let's get it on. Yes, there are times when people don't feel like having sex. The difference is that for an asexual person, that's either basically constant or it's very few and far between the times in which they do want to have sex with a specific person. So they may still engage in sex activities, but it doesn't mean they are now experiencing a sexual preference for someone. So their basic baseline experience of not having a preference toward another person sexually is not the same as an allosexual person just not having attraction to people here and there throughout the day or not feeling it as constantly. Also, don't tell people, like, don't limit yourself or like, you know, maybe think about things in the future. Keep your options open. This isn't about limiting options. This is about them informing you, hey, this is part of my identity. 
I guarantee you this is something that they have thought about. They have considered multiple angles of things. They are aware of what this means for them. Maybe they might need some help talking through, but telling them don't limit yourself is not a helpful thing. In the same way, don't tell them, oh, your poor partner or how hard it must be for them that you're not having sex. Like you don't know that they're not having sex. You don't know that they aren't talking about how to make that work for them. And you don't know that their partner is not also ace. Maybe this works for them. So try to remember that this is part of their identity. They're telling you this for a reason and it is important to them. Try to be respectful and honor when someone tells you that they are ace. So here's some asexuality resources. Um, asexualityarchive.com is a great one. This, this guy basically kind of sort of a blog and also informative thing. So he has sort of a male perspective on being ace. Asexuality Visibility and Education Network or AVEN um, is asexuality.org. It's a nonprofit organization. There's a large community of ace people there. They have a lot of resources for parents, allies, and ace people. Um, and asexual research is a really cool website. So it's just this one person's passion project where they're trying to collect all of asexual research studies and across history. I think currently they're not taking submissions, but they actually have like screen grabs of different things. And you can actually go look at um, pictures of actual texts from across history. Um, there's always a Trevor Project. Uh, I've linked here their specific study about asexuality. The Trevor Project is also a great resource just if you know any queer kids who might be needing some extra help. Again, it's a great resource for parents as well and family. Uh, what is asexuality.com is sort of in the similar vein of the asexuality archive. So now they research a lot of different things about what is asexuality. That one is less so a blog and more so like informative posts. And then if you're curious, Wikipedia has a timeline of asexual history. And so I realized I've actually flown through that kind of quickly, but that is basically my talk. Um, so I guess we will move into Q&A. Alana? Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Zena. Thank you. Wow. Um, there's always so much more to know. I thought I knew all that, but then there was more. I appreciate you. And so I just want to know um, by maybe folks um, showing a thumbs up with their reaction, if I'm okay to um, continue recording, maybe the questions would be helpful. So continue recording, thumbs up. No, I would prefer you to turn the recording off, thumbs down. Okay, They're coming in, thank you, thank you. Yeah, mahalo. Okay, let's continue to record. It looks like most people are like fine with it. And again, I do think part of the questions is if a person is having feelings or thoughts, uh, maybe seeing that someone else is thinking similarly will actually kind of break some of that open. So I do appreciate you folks allowing the record to continue. So what are those questions? You can actually take yourself off camera if you um, put yourself on camera or just send the questions via chat. So I, I'll start it off. Zena, I was wondering about microaggressions um, you know, we're a society that's very hypersexualized, and there's yes. a lot of expectation of both women and men and, and everyone, and all of the even non-binary expectations of what you're supposed to be doing and what you're supposed yeah. to do with yourself. So can you speak to that a little bit more, please? Sure. So I even just be simple things like, oh, well, you just haven't had sex yet, or like, oh, you're just naive. Oh, like you should know what you're talking about. You haven't had sex with the right person. You just got to wait till you meet the right person. Or like, oh, maybe we should have sex. Then you'll know because I'm amazing at it. Yeah. So it's just like little things like that. And also there's not really a lot of ace representation in media, right? So a lot of times it's just the romantic couple ends up having sex. So like you're watching a show and now they're having sex. It's like, I was here for the murder mystery. I don't care about them having sex like I just want so it's just constant reminders that I'm not like other people that I don't fit in with main culture and that can look show up in a lot of different ways so I'm not as similar to what people in other sexual orientations who aren't heterosexual might be experiencing as well but those are kind of some of the top off off the top of my head thoughts about what microaggressions ace people face mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that are there any other questions I'm looking at the chat let me see do I see anything Where's my chat? 
And, and it doesn't even have to be a question. Comments, um, concerns, this is the time to kind of put that out there. I recognize, Zina, that you present in a very speedy fashion. <laughs> I see the way you yeah. speak. That's how it I is. Talk, so. <laughs> You got to kind of be on your toes to hear it, but that's why we have this recording so that people can go back and like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a fair point. Does anyone want me to throw up a specific slide again? Oh, looks like we have a question. Yeah, my question is, and it's because my daughter recently um, told me she was an A spectrum. And okay. so I did, I read everything and I'm, I'm, watching your lecture but i i guess i i don't understand why it's a problem i mean she must have faced some problems to have it diagnosed i'm not sure i understand what you mean by diagnosed well her her um psychiatrist diagnosed her as ace oh. or or stated she was ace and maybe you know i i, I guess i'm trying to figure out what what would cause her to wonder the psychologist to wonder or for your daughter to wonder about being ace yeah both of them okay. because if you're not attracted you're not attracted or <laughs> yeah so the psychologist may be wondering just because to better understand what's going on with your daughter to be able to give her better care your daughter may be wondering just because it's nice to know what's going on and to know that like there are other people that are like you, right? That's kind of why we have labels so that we understand that we're not alone. So it's helpful for your daughter to know that she might fall under the ACE umbrella because then she might be able to find other people to talk to about her experiences who understand things in the same way she's experiencing them. And it's good for her therapist to know because then she knows to approach things maybe in a different way. Does that help answer your question? Sort of, but thank you. Okay. I think it's, it was a very difficult to articulate question. Yeah, it is It is hard to ask some of these questions. That kind of tends to be how talking about asexuality goes too, right? Because how do you talk about the absence of something in concrete Correct. terms? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people just go through life, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And, and with, with her, she became, she was severe, diagnosed severely depressed, and maybe this is what came mm -hmm. out of it maybe yeah so maybe this is part of what's been feeling the depression is feeling like i'm different from others no one's understanding me and people are pressuring me to be what i'm not mm -hmm. well thank you you're welcome thank you for being here and, and asking the questions too i think that um feeling alone and misunderstood and sometimes even by family um, but when you see your family members making that effort to learn and not necessarily from you, but to just go to those other sources, it just shows this extra layer of care that's lovely. So thank you, LA, for that. Definitely. Let's see, um, are there any tests that someone can take if they think they fall on one of the asexual spectrum, if they fall on the asexual spectrum besides going to a therapist? So actually, um, the Asexuality Archive has a series of articles of signs that you may be ace or someone else or a family member might be asexual. So you can always go take a look at the asexualityarchive.com there. There's not really like a formalized checklist of like, if you do these things, that means you're ace. So it's kind of more of taking a look and deciding from what people say about their experiences, if that feels like that fits for you. Just kind of like how there's not really a test for like, am I bi? Am I homosexual? Am I gay? Am I lesbian? So there's not really, so it's, it's a fair point though. I wonder if we could make tests like that, but I don't know how helpful that would be in the long run. Something to think about. Okay, good question. You're welcome, Joseph. Another question here is, I imagine romantic is under the ACE umbrella. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can you speak a bit to the difference between romantic and asexual? Is romantic also dead? Um, so I think we're meaning aromantic there. So romanticism is different from sexuality, something I didn't really touch on a whole lot. But yes, some of the terms for asexuality do also get applies to um, aromanticism. That was hard. So a lot of times those two are lumped together under the ace umbrella. 
but also sometimes they're separated into like ace and arrow, arrow being short for aromantic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're saying A as in, as in the absence of, or? Yeah. It's okay. just like how asexuality has the A in front. So it's an absence of sexual preference. Aromantic is a lack of romantic preference towards others. And so again, with that, sometimes you might have people who are demi-romantic. So certain situations, they might feel romanticism. Um, some people are, yeah, we don't, yeah. So some people do have romantic feelings, but they don't necessarily fall in, under the same way people who are not on like that spectrum fall. Thank you. Um, okay, um, AIS-12 might be a good resource to look into about assessments for an individual. What is AIS? Can, can you please type that out, SKW? Can you please type that out? Oh, I see. Uh, Amalisa did put a romantic in there. Uh, Joseph saying thank you. Are there existing? While we're waiting for the AI to get typed out, I'll keep going. Are there any existing petitions slash movements, etc., we could lend our support to that are trying to change legislation to extend explicit protections to asexual people? That is a fantastic question, and I'm a little bit surprised I didn't think of that. Um, that would have been a good thing to include. Uh, thank you for that. So I know Asexuality Archive has some reference to kind of what it means to have some of those petitions go through. Um, I don't know if there's currently anything organized, but you can always reach out to your Congress people and say like, hey, this is something we need to be working on. Um, I would imagine looking at internationalasexualityday.org's website, would help give you some information as well because they tend to put up like what are some events and things people have planned around the world. Um, yeah, asexuality.org probably also would be a good resource to look at to see because AVEN is very involved in education, right? It's part of their name, Visibility and Education Network. So I imagine that would be a good place to look for a petition as well, but I don't know of any off the top of my head or of my own knowledge. Great question. Very good question. Thank you. Okay, asexuality identification scale, 12 question questionnaire. That's in early development from the website oh. that you shared. That's great. Thank you so much. And it's from asexuality.org. Uh, that makes sense. It's asexuality Visibility and Education Network. That's pretty cool. Thanks for letting us know about that. Yeah. Oh, is your hand is up, SKW? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ewing. That's, it's a lot of great information. I thought, as just like Dr. Coffey, I was like, you know, I'll probably hear most things I recognize already, but you really did share some new licks and vocab that uh, is probably less understood by the public. And I just wanted to make a comment, and I, I believe a question will kind of matriculate out of this. Um, and it's just a sort of story about the physical development of people and that, you know, kids in middle school who don't sprout up in the way that their classmates do, or the women whose sexual development doesn't happen in the way the other girls do. And for guys, they're like not getting their hairs or their, you know, their muscles and things like that. And there's a certain comparison that happens in our society where there's a sort of, um, I want to call it like a, an agenda, like you kind of have to stay on schedule in terms of mm -hmm. being healthy development. And when you raise the sort of preferential basis upon which asexuality is currently being defined, there's a sort of like, okay, I'm waiting for my sexual attraction to kind of kick in. I want to really identify with, you know, finding a partner and being um, able to relate to people in the way that I'm looking around the block and everyone else is relating to each other that way and that seems like a very early precursor like uh yeah. la did um kind of allude to that it kind of seems like once you are not really you know your ride hasn't come so to speak where <laughs> you get taken on this sort of uh, brain journey where you're like oh man i'm really starting to be these people are really appealing now where you know they're just people before yeah. And so developmentally, that's got to be tough because that sort of innate, let's call it, 
and for I mean, I, I'm trying to be a good sport here by saying there's an innate sort of quality there. They're having to sort of um uh really kind of phone it in, like kind of just copying or what might be called masking in other domains yeah. where they're having to sort of copy even though they don't really feel like that. And mm -hmm. um I imagine that has a, a, a huge impact on the rest of their development because that didn't happen as well. And so as I'm detailing that sort of kind of missing the sort of missing the ship or the boat kind of sails without you, so to speak, there's a sort of stigma that appears as a result where people that aren't developing typically are going to be stigmatized. And yeah, um, as we encounter that, um, your thoughts about like basic principles about destigmatizing development and things like that. Um, and I think culturally, like the lines came up, like a lot of the same lines are like, oh, well, uh, you, you, let's just try and see what happens, you know, and yeah. maybe you didn't have a good time. But when you think about it from a developmental perspective, is there other considerations that come up that might taste a little different? If that makes any sense. It does. <laughs> and I feel like you already covered you. them because it's sort of like this idea that like you're waiting to have your puberty hit and like you're like okay yeah now people are attractive and i want to have sex and that might not happen for any sexual person right so i think you did a good job of summing up and answering your own question thank you <laughs> yeah because there's not a whole lot else i would add to that because i think you framed that quite lovely okay so we have just a couple of more minutes um any other questions comments or observations feel free to put them in chat or un unmute yourself thank you again so much for showing up today um in the middle of you know your saturday all of our time is super precious and you know certainly for you dr um ewing for putting together this presentation a lot of work went through such a very efficient, streamlined, thorough presentation. I appreciate it. I see Thank what you. you did there. I see what you did. Um, and I know a lot of time goes into something like that. And I think this is just, you know, people showing up from the community to take care of um, their loved ones, their friends, their family, and learn something new. So thanks everyone for showing up. Again, we'll put this up so that people can see it. And um, if you have any questions, you know, email us at Hanu Psychology Collective. We don't always have all the answers, but we try to help you find someone who does. So Dr. Ewing, I will give you last words and then I will sign, then I'll sign us all off. All right. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Alana. Thank you so much everyone for attending. I know I tend to go a little bit fast because I get excited. I apologize if I went too speedy for anyone. Um, yeah, thank you all for your questions and for caring about people in the asexual community. It means a lot. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your weekend. Hope you show up to our other talks in our series. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh, actually, Lana, someone's asking how we advertise the other Ivory Tower sessions. We'll put them on our Instagram, on Honolulu Psychology Collective's Instagram and Facebook. Great right. question. Thank you. Bye, folks. Aloha. Bye. Thank you. Aloha. Bye.